Jar Jar Binks, Anakin Skywalker, Anakin Skywalker again, and this f***ing guy. When it comes to characters who are divisive, disliked, or straight up despised, the Star Wars franchise has an entire galaxy's worth. But there is one character who was so unpopular that even the creator of Star Wars himself couldn't stand them. Hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels, and this is the story of Jackson, the six foot bright green space rabbit that George Lucas hated. Our story begins in 1975, two years before the release of Star Wars. George Lucas had approached multiple comic book companies to publish a Star Wars adaptation as a means of promoting the film. Lucas was himself a longtime comic book fan and collector, and had at one point co-owned New York's Super Snipe Comic Art Gallery with friend Ed Summer. It was through Summer that Lucas was able to study the original artwork of comic and fantasy artists such as Frank Frazetta, Al Williamson, Howard Shakin, and Alex Raymond the influence of which would be instrumental in defining the Star Wars aesthetic. In creating his own serialised space epic, Lucas was heavily inspired by pulp and comic book heroes such as Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers and Prince Valiant. Meanwhile, many sci-fi scholars have speculated about the extent to which Star Wars was influenced by Jack Kirby's New Gods or Pierre Christine and Jean-Claude Messier's Valerian and Loreline. Writing in 1981 in the foreword of a collection of Karl Barks' Scrooge McDuck comics, Lucas notes, I grew up in a time when television was just beginning to present itself in the American living room. Prior to that, comics were my main form of home entertainment. So it was no surprise then that George Lucas was keen to bring Star Wars back to its roots with a tie-in comic book. The problem was, nobody wanted to do it. Lucasfilm marketing director Charles Lippincott had met with publisher Stan Lee at Marvel Comics in 1975 to discuss the project. But as the House of Ideas faced one of many periods of fiscal misfortune, and feeling that sci-fi comics, particularly licensed ones, sold poorly, Lee wasn't prepared to take a risk on an unfinished, unknown movie called... What was it again? Space? Something? Star Wars? Ugh, that'll never catch on. Around this same time, Lucas, through Charles Lippincott and mutual friend Ed Summer, had turned to writer and ex-Marvel editor-in-chief Roy Thomas, and based on his work on Conan the Barbarian, requested that he be the one to write the Star Wars comic. After being shown production sketches of the film's cantina sequence, Thomas was convinced of the project's potential. To him, the weird and wonderful aliens, creatures and armoured troops recalled the 1940s and 50s space opera comics he had enjoyed in his youth. Titles like Planet Comics and its pulp mag equivalent, Planet Stories. Roy Thomas took the proposal back to Stan Lee, who, after seeing the writer's enthusiasm, tentatively added Star Wars to the Marvel schedule, figuring, as Thomas put it, what the heck, it'll give the kids something to do. Star Wars issue number one hit newsstands in April 1977, a whole month before the movie opened in only 43 US theatres. And nobody, not Stan Lee, not Roy Thomas, not even George Lucas was prepared for what was about to happen. The unprecedented success and unparalleled pop culture phenomenon of Star Wars led to a sudden demand for stuff. T-shirts, sticker books, lunch boxes, Kenner toys that were so sought after that they had to resort to selling empty boxes with an IOU some action figures voucher inside. As Star Wars fever swept the United States and later the world, fans were left clamouring for as much merchandise, memorabilia and tie-in material as they could get their Burger King covered greasy little fingers on. For Marvel, the Star Wars series would go on to become one of the publisher's top selling titles, with former editor-in-chief Jim Shooter stating that the franchise single-handedly saved the company from financial ruin in 1977 and 1978. Issues 1-6 to six featured a pretty straight adaptation of the events of the film, written by Roy Thomas and artist Howard Chaykin, who had also been hired at the request of George Lucas. But with such a monumental hit on their hands, Marvel wasn't about to cease publication after only six issues. And so, with issue number 7, the comic book company began producing original stories set within the Star Wars universe. Thomas was given strict instructions not to use Darth Vader, cover the Clone Wars, or develop a romance between Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia. Instead, the writer continued the series with a storyline focusing on Han Solo and Chewbacca, inspired by Akira Kurosawa's 1954 epic Seven Samurai. In Star Wars issue 8, a story titled Eight for Aduba 3 sees the smuggler turned hero of the Rebel Alliance and his Wookiee companion putting together a ragtag team of down-on-their-luck spacers to defend a neighbouring village from bandits. 
It's here that readers were first introduced to the hair-raising Hedgy, the dazzling but deadly Amazer Fox Train, and the wannabe Jedi Knight with the puntastic name Don Juan Quixote. Oh, and then there was Jackson, the six-foot-tall, green-furred rabbit in a spacesuit, who, even in the world of Wookiees, Jawas, and whatever the hell this guy is, stuck out like, well, a bright green Bugs Bunny lookalike. Out of my way, Roden. I just found out that new guy is hiring spacers, and I want some money so as I can get off of this rock. I ain't no Roden, Captain, and I'm next in line, so why don't you just... Ugh. You mean you was next? Now open up in there, pal, and let me... Excuse me, Junior, but I really gotta insist you haul your carcass back to the end of the line, you know? Blast off, Roden, or there's plenty more fists where that one came from. I ain't about to doubt it, pal, but like I said before, <gasps> I ain't no rodent. I'm more what you call your basic lepers carnivorous. A meat-eating, rocket-riding rabbit to you, Junior. Oh yeah, and give my regards to the boys in the bar. I saw that, rabbit. Well, hooray for your side. You must have been eating your space carrots. Never could stand them myself. I'm... I heard a meat-eater. One that needs a job, right? Well, I ain't standing out here for the decor. You got another name besides... Jackson. You can call me Jax for short, which I ain't. Jackson is a Lepus carnivorous, or Lepi, which is a species of sentient rabbit in the Star Wars universe. Known for his quick wit and even quicker temper, you could say he's hopping mad with a hair trigger. He knows karate, he knows karaze, and with blasters in hand, he knows kablamo. As captain of his ship called the Rabbit's Foot, the Lepi smuggler was one of several spaces assembled by Han Solo to form the Star Hoppers of Aduba 3. Now, Roy Thomas's run on Star Wars was short-lived, ending only after 10 issues. The writer felt that the sacred cow status that Star Wars had achieved was limiting the kinds of stories that he was allowed to tell. And the final straw came when Charles Lippincott called Thomas to tell him that George Lucas wasn't a fan of Jackson. Writing in a 2007 issue of Alter Ego magazine, Thomas recounts that, George particularly disliked one of the seven being a six-foot alien who resembled a green Bugs Bunny in space gear. In the latter instance, I had been inspired in part by seeing a porky pig looking alien in the cantina sequence, either in the rough cut or in some production sketches at some early point. I had figured my green rabbit, Jackson, wasn't really much weirder than a Wookiee, but obviously George, as the creator of the Star Wars mythos, felt differently. Thomas's departure would pretty much halt any further development of Jackson, although the Lepi smuggler did return to the series six issues later. Now written by Archie Goodwin, with art by Walt Simonson and Bob Wyacek, Star Wars issue 16 sees Jackson captured and interrogated by a Fudd and Daffy. You know, like Elmer Fudd and Daffy Duck. I hesitate to even call this a reference. This is Archie Goodwin nodding, winking, and straight up pointing towards the Space Rabbit's Looney Tunes inspiration. Later in the issue, Jax is reunited with a Mazer Fox Train and Marvel's Luke Skywalker surrogate Jim Deshun, the self-proclaimed Starkiller Kid, to once again save the day. And that, I'm sad to say, was the last time Jackson would appear in any Star Wars media for over 20 years. Fast forward to 2001, and Star Wars is back, baby! Two years after the release of The Phantom Menace, and George Lucas' prequel trilogy is in full swing, introducing a whole new generation to the world of the Force, Jedi Knights, lovable droids, and, uh, trade negotiations. Jackson was brought out of retirement for issue four of Star Wars Gamer magazine, in which writers Pablo Hidalgo, Corey J. Henson, and Michael McAlian profiled the Star Hoppers of Aduba 3. The article provided background information on Jackson and his species, and summarised all of his appearances in the Marvel Comics run. Once again drawing inspiration from Bugs Bunny, Hidalgo writes that the Lepi colonised all five worlds of the Coachell system, and the asteroid belt therein. Uh, uh, pardon me, sir, but could you direct me to the shortest route to the Coachella Valley at the Big Carrot Festival therein? The article also makes reference to a gang of mercenaries, among whom Jackson learned his marksmanship, called the Boys of Chorus. Oh, we are the Boys of Chorus, we hope you like our show, we know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. 
Beyond that though, Jackson didn't make much of a comeback in the new millennium, and his appearances were limited to Blink and You'll Miss Him cameos in webcomics. Jackson's final fate was eventually hinted at in a 2012 episode of The Clone Wars, titled A Sunny Day in the Void, in which a skeleton is found in a crash shuttle that bears more than a passing resemblance to the Lepi smuggler. In 2014, following the acquisition of the Star Wars franchise by Disney, and anticipating the arrival of a new sequel trilogy, Lucasfilm announced that the expanded universe, including basically all license and spin-off stories from the main Star Wars films, would be rebranded as Star Wars Legends, and considered non-canon. With all of Jackson's Marvel Comics exploits permanently cut from continuity, surely, surely there was no way that the furry fiend could burrow his way back into the new Star Wars canon. Eh, think again, pal. In 2015, Jackson made a cameo appearance on a variant cover of Star Wars Issue 1, and then again on Vader Down Issue 1, and then again on Poe Dameron Issue 1. Then in 2018, the Jade Jackrabbit was featured as a background character in an episode of the animated web series Forces of Destiny. Slowly but surely, Jackson was being re-canonized. Nature was healing. That same year, both Jackson and on-again, off-again love interest Amazer Foxtrain got starring roles in the pages of Star Wars Adventures Annual 2018. This comic, aimed at younger readers, would turn out to be the perfect venue for an outrageously outspoken space bunny, and Jackson would get follow-up stories in Star Wars Adventures Annual 2019, 2020, and in the Star Wars Adventures miniseries Ghosts of Vader's Castle. Which, by the way, is a really cool little comic, if you, like me, love both Star Wars and ooky spooky haunted house stuff. Check it out, that's my top tip of the video. All of these appearances were written by Cavan Scott, who even added Jackson to the Star Wars literary canon in 2020, with a short story in the anthology novel From a Certain Point of View, The Empire Strikes Back. This story, entitled Fake It Till You Make It, further fleshed out the Lepi's new canon backstory, and revealed his full name to be Jackson T. Tumparaki. Mmm, really rolls off the tongue. In 2019, as part of the comic book company's 80th anniversary celebrations, Marvel published Star Wars issue 108, a one-off special that returned to the old Legends continuity of the original Marvel Star Wars comics. This double-sized issue was a loving send-off to the old canon versions of characters like Jackson and Amazer, and the corner of the Star Wars expanded universe first carved out by Roy Thomas and Howard Chaykin over 40 years earlier. Look, here's the thing, I can't help but really love Jackson, and the rest of Thomas and Chaykin's Starhoppers of Aduba 3. If Disney came and parked a truck full of cash outside my house and said, make any Star Wars thing you want, I'd probably make a Starhoppers movie. You know, kind of a James Gunn Suicide Squad type deal, with these super campy, colourful, Zedless characters in the dusty, dilapidated world of Star Wars. I just think they're neat. When Jackson first debuted in the Marvel comics of the 1970s, I think it's fair to say that he wasn't an instant fan favourite. But nowadays the character is remembered more fondly as a kind of novelty relic of a bygone era, when Star Wars was just a low-budget sci-fi franchise scraping together influences from comics, pulp novels, Greek mythology, Chinese philosophy, Japanese cinema, Judeo-Christianity, real-world history, and yes, even Warner Brothers cartoons. To me, Jackson represents the same line of seat-of-the-pants creativity that placed a dude in an off-the-shelf Wolfman mask in the cantina sequence of A New Hope. This is what Star Wars is to me. It's a little bit scrappy, a little bit thrown together, a little bit goofy. Well, alright, it's very goofy. But that's what makes it so brilliant. And Jackson is kind of the platonic ideal of Star Wars innate crappiness. In a 2012 poll conducted by Star Wars Insider, fans were asked which Star Wars character they would most like to see be made into an action figure. And Jackson placed third. And in 2021, Hasbro made dreams come true by bringing the Lepi to their Black Series line of action figures. Reflecting on Jackson's legacy all these years later, Roy Thomas notes that he felt somewhat vindicated when, two decades later, Lucas introduced the much more maligned Jar Jar Binks. But in a world in which another spacefaring, blaster-toting, anthropomorphic woodland creature from an obscure 70s comic can become one of the stars of the biggest movie franchise of all time, I think it's time for a reappraisal of Jackson and his role in Star Wars history. The first issue of Marvel's tie-in series could be found on spinner racks a month before Star Wars hit theaters. Alongside a 1976 novelization of the film, the comic was the earliest Star Wars spin-off material available to fans meaning that Jackson was among the first handful of original Star Wars characters to be created outside of the films. Everything that has come since, the TV shows, the video games, the novels, the entire Star Wars expanded universe, 
It can all be traced back to Roy Thomas, Howard Shaken, and their big green Bugs Bunny lookalike. And that, heroes, is What's Up Doc. Hey, thanks for watching this video, and a special thanks to Eric Azana, voiceover extraordinaire and host of the Geek Explain podcast, for providing the voice of Han Solo in this video. I've been working on this video since the start of the year, and Eric recorded his line so long ago that I doubt he even remembers doing it. <laughs> but it was great, he's great, and you should go and check out his podcast, linked in the description below. Nice one, Eric. If you want to see more comic book videos like this one, don't forget to subscribe to Panels to Pixels and give that bell icon a little ring-a-ding-ding -ding so you never miss out on future uploads. As always, heroes, be kind, be happy, tell someone that you love them, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.